Welcome back to a review I'm doing specifically for Halloween because it's a ghost story. But I'm also doing it because very few films have made me truly angry like this one did. But I want to make something clear. Because I don't want to get into the shit on this one. This video is opinion, not facts. Opinion, not facts. Now, some people might think this video is an attack on the belief in the paranormal. It's not. Also, when I say Ed and Lorraine Warren are money-grubbing charlatans out for notoriety above all else, remember, opinions, not facts. Right, now that that's out of the way, The Conjuring 2 proudly states from the real case files of Ed and Lorraine Warren, starting off with the exaggerated bollocks from the get-go. And yes, Hollywood likes to change and enhance real-life events, but this is definitely the straw that broke the camel's back. And despite this film taking place in England, about a haunting there, the film begins at none other than the fucking Amityville Horror House. Where's Deadpool when you need him? We then meet Ed and Lorraine Warren, who despite being in the house to check if it is haunted, we see them conduct a seance using Lorraine as the medium. Cause God fucking forbid a scientific method to this kind of shit. But anyway, the seance begins and Lorraine gives us information on old Ronnie DeFeo and his murders as she psychically travels through the house reenacting them, showing the parents and then the two boys being shot to death. I said this when I reviewed the Amityville Horror, but just what the fuck must DeFeo, who's still incarcerated, be thinking when films like this get shown to audiences across the world? Probably something along the lines of, yeah, more gullible twats. Because as a consequence of films like this, and the Amityville Horror to a lesser extent, because it was still based on a story that claimed to be factual, is that it all feels like it's just excusing a mass murderer. While Lorraine continues to shoot the fuck out of everyone, she suddenly freaks out as a creepy ghost child looks at her, who she follows downstairs, and is told by Ed to stop, but she follows the child into the basement, as it runs around for a while, before the whole ghost family then directs Lorraine to a mirror. Whoa, hang on. A mysterious entity is forcing people to kill, and those that are killed get turned into creepy ghosts with glowing eyes who are drawn to a mysterious mirror. Somebody owes Mike Flanagan some fucking money. But regardless of that, the image we saw of the ghost boy... This is actually a recreation of one of the most famous images ever caught in the Amityville house. This image, in fact... However, the majority of rational-minded people don't believe it's a ghost, but a picture of Paul Bartz, a member of the Warren investigation, and the infrared film adds a spooky effect to his eyes. But considering the wide belief that the Warrens were less than credible investigators, producing vast swathes of crap considered evidence, I wouldn't be surprised. To continue, Lorraine notices a figure behind her in the mirror. Sadly, it's not Karen Gillan, but a ghostly, evil-looking Marilyn Manson nun, presumably promoting a new album, who starts to choke Lorraine. But when she sees a silhouette of Ed seemingly being impaled, the seance stops. Yes, open those curtains. I'm sure that'll help the hysterical woman screaming. Well done. And once the scene ends, we get some scrolling text about the Warrens and how it's based on a true story. Bollocks! Now that introduction was to emulate the first film, which also started with a story about something unrelated to the main plot. But for The Conjuring 2, it wasn't that it was unrelated to the main plot. It was unrelated to the Amityville investigation, which is something we will learn when we find out more information on Marilyn Manson Nun. We then move to England, and fucking hell does the film want you to know it, as we get a montage of England, like the kind of slideshow you show aliens to help them understand, while London Calling by The Clash is playing, because the one thing this film does better than anything else is cliché and stereotype. 
It's then we see one of the more central characters for the film, Janet Hodgson, with her smoking friend, who gives her the cigarette to hold, while mentioning a Ouija board they made. And to cause some pointless conflict throughout the film, Janet is caught by a teacher and told off for smoking. Janet is met up with her brother and sister at the end of school when some boys bully her brother because of his speech problem. Why? They don't show up again, and it has no reason to be in the movie. It's just here for the audience to sympathise with the young children. So the easiest way to do this was to have the characters being bullied, apparently. We then see the Hodgson's residence, which seems to be made to look as lower class and grotty as possible, all the while the mother of the house, Peggy, is on the phone trying to pay bills. They're a lower working class family, don't you know? And Janet is told off for smoking, which leads to a big shouting match of everyone in the family, where nothing is even actually said, just spouting what we already know at each other. And that night before bed, oh, for fuck's sake, Janet and her sister mess around with a Ouija board. But fortunately, we don't get a cameo from Captain Howdy, as all that happens is a few minutes of the film are wasted, truly making you despair at the quality of the film's writers now. And yes, Janet Hodgson did say a Ouija board was used prior to the events, but every other source of information for this case never mentions it. Look, just stop putting Ouija boards in horror films, they're not evil. To give you a bit of history, the Ouija board was created by Elijah Bond, who promoted them through his company, the Swastika Novelty Company. Yeah, not a joke. And he then sold it to Hasbro. Hasbro of all people. Which, considering Transformers and the Battleship movie, maybe they are evil. But the original purpose of the Ouija board was that you would contact your own subconscious, not the dead. And it's shit like this movie that keep the mass hysteria of Ouija boards going. Just end it. And once everyone has gone to bed, the spookiness begins, as Janet suddenly finds herself downstairs on the floor, which never happened in reality. And upstairs, her sister is woken up by banging on the door, thinking it was Janet, who makes her way back to bed unaware. We get a brief scene the next day of laundry being started, only for the thing to spray water everywhere. It's just an excuse for why the basement will be flooded later in the film. But again, no bearing on reality. But let's see what the Warrens are up to. And not surprisingly, they're not researching or investigating or anything like that. No, they're on a talk show about Amityville. And what I find interesting here is that there's a sceptic there with them, basically saying the Warrens are talking bollocks. And the fun part is that the sceptic is supposed to be the bad guy, when he talks all the sense and kind of makes Ed Warren look pretty unstable. Because when it comes to ghost hunting and supernatural research, the number one thing anyone in the field, including the real Enfield haunting investigators experience, is people calling you a liar. That's the main ever-present criticism anyone would get. So how does Ed react? What exactly are you a doctor of, anyway? Come on, Warren, try and show a little class, I'm not going to show yeah. class. It's somebody who's sitting here telling lies about my wife and Be me. Be careful who you call a liar. What are you going to do about it? He's like a child in a playground, challenging someone to a fight. Where's your reams of evidence? Your eyewitness reports, stories, physical objects taken from the site. If Ed Warren has such ironclad proof, why doesn't he mention any of it? And this is not just me viciously attacking the guy, because the film itself just proved what I said. And he's supposed to be the main character and the voice of reason. Back at Enfield, Janet and her brother Billy are using an old Crooked Man nursery rhyme Zoe trope to help him fix his speech impediment. And once everyone's gone to bed, the spooky fun begins, as Billy wakes up and gets a glass of water, but sees the swing in the garden move on its own accord. Ooh, how truly terrifying. Upstairs, Janet has a nightmare, seemingly being calmed down by her sister, until she sits bolt upright and starts talking with two slightly different voices. The lower, more aggressive voice claims Janet and her family is trespassing in their home. She's calmed down once again, but quickly shouts at the wall, and that's when Margaret hears something behind her. Oh god, it's the ghost of Patrick McGowan. Of course, the scariest part is he's supposed to be still alive at the time. But also, holy crap is the film really escalating its timeline of the hauntings to a ridiculous degree. I mean, let's forget about the actual difficult to explain incidents and move straight to the possession and silly voices, yeah? But credit where credit's due, there are some decently chilling moments, such as when Billy returns to bed, a distinct figure is seen sitting watching him. 
Upstairs, Billy puts a toy fire engine away, only for it to slide along the floor to his bedroom, and after investigating, a loud scream is heard. When his mother goes to investigate, she finds nothing, but there are more suspicious sounds heard downstairs, which is where she finds Janet in the creepy chair, quickly sending her back to bed. The next day, Janet is home from school, ill, and of course, spookiness ensues with the TV changing channels, and the remote control disappearing, turning up on the creepy chair when Janet answers the phone. However, as lightning strikes knocking the TV signal out, you can hear the heralding of the film, resorting to shouting boo in your face, as opposed to anything substantial. My house! Yeah, you see? After that scare, we revisit Night Owl and Mystic Meg, the latter of which is painting the evil Manson nun, saying it came to him in a dream. And I'm not sure why someone who apparently deals with demons and evil forces would paint that, rather than do some actual fucking research on it. But no, he can't even talk to his wife about it, because the story needs to be artificially paced and padded. Back in Enfield, Janet has resorted to tying herself to her bed, which helps when she's flung onto the floor out of it. More bangs on the door are heard, but Janet sees no one there. However, she decides to investigate further with a torch, getting scared by the creepy chair moving, running back to her room and barricading the door with another chair. But the fun doesn't stop there, as the chair appears next to Janet's bed with the door open, and footsteps are heard. She quickly hides under the blankets until they're thrown off and she's attacked by an unseen force. Both her and her sister run to tell their mother, and to emphasise the violence of the attack, Janet now has a very definite bite mark on her shoulder. Hmm... Hmm. You know, I don't think that bit happened in reality. I'm going to be filing that one under B for bullshit. Their mother examines the room, rationally thinking it's an intruder, but inevitably she finds the Ouija board under Janet's bed, the film predictably making a big deal out of that thing. However, when she tells the girls to go to bed, the dresser then slides across the floor, blocking the door. Pfft, fucking finally! Something that aligns with reality for once. The dresser moving was actually one of the very first supernatural things witnessed, so it's about time. The family quickly freak out and run across the road to the neighbours. Oh, thanks for telling us that movie. We would have been completely in the dark without that. The house is investigated and found to be empty. Billy then sees the neighbour's dog ringing a bell, which he's been trained to do when he wants to go out. It's in the movie to signpost a scary moment later. So keep your eyes peeled for that. But trust me, you really won't be fucking missing it. The police have showed up to examine the strange noises around the house using a chair, and that's when all of them see the chair slide back under the table on its own. The chair incident is one of the most well-known aspects of the case, being seen by Peggy Hodgson, her neighbour, and two police officers. And although it wasn't shown in the film, the police did investigate if it could be faked, but couldn't replicate the incident. Now I'm telling you this because the Enfield haunting is genuinely intriguing, with many incidents that investigators have trouble explaining. Plenty of material for a film. So my point is, the writers didn't need to resort to the complete bollocks we're going to be getting into. Right on cue, we're back to the Wonder Twins. Lorraine is studying her Bible, while her daughter, who really should be a fully grown adult at the time this film is based, makes something with beads when she notices something behind her. Lorraine finds she's outside the room when none other than Manson Nun has appeared. Why? Fuck if I know. Also, back in the room, let's marvel at the filmmaker's cleverness by having the big letters on the bookshelf display the word Valak. A pointless nod for the audience without reason for it to be there. Lorraine has gone into Ed's study where, for reasons that are fucking beyond me, he's actually hung the painting he did. Was he really that fond of it? Or is he just fine with the demonic nun death stare? And once more, yes, I concede the film gets creepy again, as the light next to the painting goes out, and Lorraine gets ever closer to the painting, slowly ramping up the tension as it becomes more real in the shadows, and its eyes glow ominously. It's a very well done piece of tension. So how does the film fuck it up? Well, Lorraine watches a shadow move to the painting, and then... That's the best it could come up with. It stuck its face to the painting like it was at the fucking seaside. And it's supposed to be the big bad. Yeah, just remember that when it tries to scare you throughout the film. After being flung backwards, Lorraine finds herself in the Amityville basement once again. Manson appears and Lorraine asks who it is. Which is when we see she's really back at home scrabbling in her Bible. 
She then asks what it wants, and we see Ed getting impaled once more. Yeah, oh dear, what a pity, never mind. Back to the actual point, Peggy is approached by a news program, as they've heard about the incidents. They did some vox pops of people explaining what they've seen, and the news segments are pretty faithful recreations of interviews given at the time, by the two police officers, for example, as you can see. Although the film version is vastly more stilted and unnatural looking. Also, a lollipop lady, crossing guard for Americans out there, mentions how she saw Janet floating past her bedroom window several feet off the floor. Now, that's a true eyewitness account, so why did the movie skip over putting that in? What ghost movie doesn't bother putting in ghost stuff? We then meet one of the principal investigators of the Enfield haunting, Morris Gross, who was involved with the family from start to finish, so obviously he barely appears in this film. It then recreates the most famous aspect of the Enfield case, the televised conversation with the voice of a ghost, as Janet becomes possessed and starts growling, snarling and talking with the evil sounding voice of an old man, calling himself Bill Wilkins. Let's watch some of the film's version. I like to hear them scream. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, how very scary, don't you think? I mean, for something like that to be televised, you'd think there'd be mass hysteria at the time, and the case would become an exorcism or something. Yeah, except the real-life interview was nowhere near as sensational. Have a look. How many voices are there? Six hundred. Six hundred the voices. I know the joke. <laughs> no, no. Who's there? Doctor A. Doctor Who? Goose Chase is here. Wow, wasn't that truly fucking terrifying? But the fact that the real Janet could do that without destroying her vocal cords after talking like that for hours either shows she's an amazing ventriloquist or there was something else going on. It's very intriguing, but not demonic, like this film and the Warrens suggest. And in parapsychology circles, the Warrens were known for inventing demons and ghosts when really none existed. Anyway, after the frankly load of complete bollocks masquerading as an exorcist ripoff, the family are sleeping in the neighbour's house. And remember the dog with the bell? Well, the scares have come to collect. And hold on to your butt, cause you're not ready for this. As Billy is woken up by said bell, finding the dog sitting by the door, but it's not as it seems. This is all new! What the fuck is that supposed to be? Oh, but it turns out to be Janet speaking in her creepy voice again, as the protective fire grate is thrown, destroying a cabinet. The fireplace protector was, in reality, witnessed to have been thrown at a highly dangerous speed, so that is accurate. The rest of it? Where do they come up with this shit? And I can understand spicing things up slightly for a film, but for fuck's sake, a dog just did a John Carpenter's The Thing. After this incident, a few parties are now interested, so we shift back to Pinky and Psychic Perky, listening to a record of Janet's spooky voice, and the church unofficially asks the Warrens to observe the Enfield haunting to check if it's a hoax. After discussions, Lorraine finally tells Ed about her premonition and agrees to the observation of Enfield, making a point of saying that they're only there to watch and will not get involved. Yeah, I wonder how long that's gonna last. So in England, the Warrens meet with Morris and are taken straight to the house. But I'm actually confused, because that's actually not how it happened, did it, Ed? The Warrens went there to help the family, didn't they? Very altruistic. So we'll overlook the fact that they showed up completely uninvited. But what I find confusing is that in reality, they first met with Guy Lyon Playfair. Who's that, you might ask? Well, he's the guy who literally wrote the fucking book on the Enfield haunting and is actually suspiciously absent from the film. Now, maybe that's because, unlike Morris, he's still alive and could protest this shit show. Or maybe it's the fact that the only thing he can remember about meeting the Warrens is Ed telling him how much money they could make out of all of it. Because they're there to help, remember? Also, concerning Guy Playfair's book, the Warrens don't even get a single sentence mention in it. Which just kind of shows 
just how fucking useless they really were to the investigation. But onwards and upwards, as Ed is shown to the girl's room. Now, what the fuck? Fucking hell. I know you like your spooky imagery for the trailers, but that's just ridiculous. And didn't fucking happen either. The girls have really used the bedroom throughout the entire investigation. And Morris seems to approve of this fucking insanity, when in reality, he would be the first to encourage rationality. In the garden, which looks like it slipped into Silent Hill, Lorraine talks to Janet on the swing set, who laments feeling tired all the time and people being afraid of her. But forget that. Ed is told about Bill's old chair and how Peggy's ex-husband took all the music records. And then we're right back to the depressed and exhausted young girl, who should be the focus. Janet also reveals the voice is talking to her at that moment, saying it wants to hurt the Warrens. We then move to an experiment the film shows us Ed devised to convince the church of its authenticity, when it was actually Morris Gross's idea to fill Janet's mouth with water and then put tape over it to see if she could still produce the voice, in order to persuade scientific-minded people, the heads of the Society for Cyclical Research. Oh, and yes, in the real experiment, Janet was still able to produce the voice no problem, adding to its authenticity. In the film's version, Janet is initially unable to make any kind of sound, so she tells the adults the voice wants them to turn their backs. They obey her, and I'll give the film a modicum of respect, as behind Ed, Janet is all blurry, allowing the camera work to imply the shape of a different person. The conversation aligns with reality too, as Bill rejects the idea he's dead and wants to see his family, angry he's unable to do so. A lot of the dialogue is accurate, but then it slips back into fiction as Ed flashes his cross, like Bill's a fucking vampire, causing him to leave pretty quickly. This film, just like Ed Warren, would much prefer to suggest some kind of malevolent demon was taking part in this, rather than any other kind of explanation. Because whether you believe in a poltergeist or not, the ideas proposed by the real investigators never suggested a demon, and the research all pointed to the fact that the real Bill Wilkins wasn't a particularly nice man to begin with. But no, that's not Hollywood bullshit enough, apparently. Before going to bed, Janet tells her mother about the cigarette and how she was just holding it. Why she believes her now and not before, who knows. But yeah, pointless non-conclusion to a pointless subplot. And once everyone's asleep, the supernatural parts of the case are taken from plausible to complete batshit and bananas, as Janet wakes up on the roof of the living room, and she sees Bill in his chair slowly walk upstairs, where Janet is pulled through the roof and back into her bedroom. What is the point of all those crosses if they clearly do fuck all? Oh, I know, this. <laughs> And once more, the writers display their ignorance, content to ride the waves of mediocrity and the most cliché crap imaginable. Because I hate to burst the bubble of any writers of demonic slash exorcism style movies, but an upside down cross is not satanic. It's not even an evil symbol. It's the symbol of St. Peter who chose to be crucified upside down. So it's actually a good symbol and makes no fucking sense to be in the film in this context. It's just shitty lazy writing, because I found that out after a single Google search. Another bill attack ensues with Janet trapped in the bedroom, and her mother tries to pull the door open. And I know it's a stressful situation, but she doesn't even think to use the key until the two Ronnies come running to help, saving Janet from a curtain being wrapped around her neck. Which is an incident that occurred, but in a completely different set of circumstances, because like I said, in reality the bedroom was never left locked. Later at a local pub, the Warrens and everyone else involved in the case, or as I like to call them, the only people involved in the case, examine all the information known, including some of the more well-known pieces of evidence from the actual case, like photos supposedly depicting Janet being thrown out of bed. And with the photographs, yeah, it's a nice nod to the actual case with accurate recreations of the images, but this is a movie. Why wouldn't they just show stuff like that? It's all just a missed opportunity set aside for the more ridiculous aspects of this film. The basic air of the conversation is scepticism, with everyone thinking it's an elaborate hoax. But the Warrens are willing to stay the course and help the family. <coughs> Bullshit. <clears throat> oh, I got such a bad cough for this review, I don't know why. We then get complete pointless bollocks of the Warrens and Hodgins playing happy families, which is just another fabrication, since the couple were there for a maximum of two days. 
So the stuff of the film is just pure egotism, designed to make the Warrens look like they actually gave a shit. Especially when Morris Gross and Guy Playfair actually did give a shit, but they're ejected from the film, completely in Guy's case. So it's just a disrespectful insult as far as I'm concerned. Oh hey, I just said this film was a disrespectful insult to Morris Gross and Guy Playfair. Did that seem harsh to anyone out there? Well, allow me to retort. As outside the house, Morris is talking with Lorraine, and he mentions how historic it would be to get definitive proof. To which Lorraine says, This isn't a laboratory, this is someone's house. And I think helping that family is the only thing that matters. Oh, 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 I've never been so angry at a film before. How fucking dare you? You take the memory of a man who dedicated everything he had to investigating and ultimately resolving this case just to placate the egos, the arrogance, the insane delusions of a money-grubbing glorified magician. This is why I've been so harsh on this film. Because it's not about telling the real story. It's about the demon-hunting-for-God fantasy Ed and Lorraine Warren like to portray, all the while throwing everyone else under the bus. This is a disgusting, disrespectful, insulting shitshow. That is why I'm doing this review. Guy Playfair can and does defend himself, but for people like Morris, who are sadly not with us, I'm defending people like him. The writers do allow Morris to mention his daughter, who died less than 12 months before The Haunting, not a few years as the film states, hence why he's so interested. But we don't learn how his daughter was also named Janet, and how he cared for the family's well-being because of that. But no, that would make him far too sympathetic. Fuck you, Conjuring 2. Continuing with the shit show, Ed is in the flooded basement trying to fix the plumbing, probably because he can't fix the ghost problem, so this is second best. And while down there, Bill appears behind him, but he suddenly drags Peggy under the water, leaving another bite wound on her arm, with Ed finding a dental plate that fits the missing two teeth of the wound. Why that fucking matters at this point, who knows. Back with the kids, they're setting up Christmas decorations when Janet sees something wrong in the kitchen. But for some bizarre reason, this time, there's no evidence of anything there to see. Which hasn't happened before, so I don't know why the film's being coy now. One of the brothers goes into the kitchen and he finds a load of knives stabbed into the table. But then Janet supposedly disappears and reappears in the kitchen brandishing a knife. As the adults return home and all hell breaks loose, with everything being flung everywhere. They do eventually manage to get into the kitchen to find Johnny in the cupboard, yet Janet is missing. But following the sounds, they find Janet contorted in the airing closet, and fortunately, thanks to Ed, the power of Christ compels her, and the possessing spirit leaves. This is when a big supposed twist occurs, as the woman from before has a video of Janet herself causing all the chaos, smashing stuff and bending utensils, so everyone now thinks it's fake. However, the sceptic woman is depicted as being a complete pompous bitch. Because, to a true believer like the Warrens, and people who make this shit specifically for the Warrens' ego, sceptics are the enemy and nothing else. Which is such a bullshit argument, frankly. Everyone is told to leave by Peggy, including Morris, once again disrespected. Even the Warrens are abandoning the investigation because of the videotape. Which really doesn't disprove any of the evidence, just brings it into question. Because all they showed was Janet faking a single incident but there are still many incidents that are difficult to explain. It's just a deliberate fake-out moment so that Ed and Lorraine Warren, the psychic Avengers, can swoop in and be the heroes. Oh, and I can tell you right now, everything that happens in the film from now on is complete made-up monkey shite. <sighs> Let's get to the heroic moment, shall we? The Warrens are taking the train to leave, and Janet reveals that she was told by the spirit to make everyone leave, otherwise it would kill her family which was a simple and easy way of getting out of that then. And on the train, Ed drops a tape recording and it forms a cross. Ooh, it's a sign. <sighs> Fucking hell. They go through the tape of Bill's conversations and they find that the two separate recordings form one sentence, as Bill was really saying that something was keeping him there. Lorraine then sees Bill as he was, who tells Lorraine that something wants Janet and good old Manson is eventually revealed to be behind the whole thing. As well as why it chooses to look like a nun. Something inhuman. Something that's taking a blasphemous form to attack my faith. Really? That's the bullshit reason they're going with? Okay, 
on the subject of Lorraine, I'm not doubting she's religious. However, when you take into account verses like Deuteronomy 18.10, Isaiah 8.9, Leviticus 26, and Jeremiah 27.9, all of which state perfectly clearly how mediums are an affront and abomination to God. Now, personally, I could give a halfpenny jizz what the Bible says, but the facts are clear. You can't be a medium and religious. They don't go together. You can't have it both ways. The Warrens have decided to go back to the house just as shit gets real with Janet full on Pazuzu, throwing her sister at the wall, and the family leave the house, being locked out by Janet. And on the drive over, the Warrens have figured out that Bill told them the demon's name, which will allow them to cast it out. Seems oversimplified to me, but whatever. At the house, the place is locked tight, so Ed tries a window, getting a couch to the face, which was satisfying to watch, if nothing else. Ed gets into the house through the basement, and the door is locked behind him. Ed wants to go on ahead, yet Lorraine's afraid of the whole impalement stuff, doesn't want him to go alone. But he does anyway. Again, oh dear, what a pity, never fucking mind. In the house, to make matters worse, Ed gets a face full of steam to impair his vision. And despite all the shit this film does, there are still some slightly creepy moments. Like a hand snaking around the doorframe, or undefined figures moving around, but it's not enough to save it. Back outside, Lorraine is still trying to figure out the name of the demon, remembering the incident before with the Bible, which despite being completely destroyed, she still has with her. And she figures out the demon's name is Valak, just as lightning strikes a tree, creating a lovely spike for Ed to get used to. But now that we have the demon's name, I can do a bit of demonology research of my own, because Valak is actually mentioned in the Lesser Key of Solomon, although it's spelt with a C and not K. Nothing about Marilyn Manson nuns either. Valak is described as being a boy with angel wings riding on the back of a two-headed dragon. So, as well as being the giver of answers to hidden treasures, as it says, we can also add really fucking unimaginative if he's gone from two-headed dragon to Manson Nun. But you know what? I really couldn't give a shit about this film anymore, and I'm just going to swiftly move through the climax. Ed finds Billy's zoetrope turning itself on, leading to another appearance from that fucking ridiculous thing, and Lorraine makes her own way through the house to save Ed, just as he finds Janet trying to jump from the window. He manages to grab her in time, but the curtain slowly comes loose. Lorraine enters, and so does Valak, who stops her from helping, but using its name in ridiculously over-the-top fashion gets rid of it, and Ed is saved at the last minute. And the film ends with everything back to normal. The family is saved and the Warrens are heroes. Who fucking Ray. We then get some information, as the film thinks it still has any kind of credibility left. With the ominous statement that Peggy Hodgson died in the same chair Bill did. Ooh, spooky. Oh, and let's not forget, Ed takes the Zoe trope for his personal collection. Yeah, you just help yourself, Ed. That's perfectly fine, you prick. It's not like Billy was using that to help with his speech problems or anything. No, you just take it and let it gather dust in your shitty museum. So that was The Conjuring 2. It's not just a crappy horror film, it's an insulting, disrespectful shrine to a money-grubbing charlatan. Opinions, not facts. Opinions, not facts. Let's be honest, you should know my opinion on this film by now. I hate it, in every way imaginable. But one thing I've yet to mention is why did the filmmakers decide to make a film out of a case the Warrens had barely any involvement? From the real case files, it states. Yeah, all nine pages. So why not anything else? Shit, why not make a film about the Amateurville case they looked at at the start? Well, turns out the studio didn't have the rights to use it. After the release of Conjuring 1, Warner Brothers was sued over the use of the real case files by Evergreen Media Group, who stated that New Line was only given rights to a very limited amount of cases, less than 1%. So, what were they to do? Not make a sequel to an incredibly popular and successful film? Nah, they had to rake in those cash money dollars. So they concocted this loose stool water of a film instead. So there you go, the real reason this film was made. Desperation, the lure of money, and the need to make a quick buck over anything substantial. Which, after watching it, I'm not surprised. 
Oh, and if you're interested in knowing what really happened in this case, do give Guy Lyon Playfair's book, This House is Haunted, a read. It's far more rational, down to earth, and interesting than this shit. Thank you for watching, and I'm going to go rest in a darkened room to calm down. See you next time.